got a question for you. Do you like rules? Or are you one of those people that think the only rules, re- reason rules exist is to be broken? Now, my wife, Cindy, is a rule follower. If there is a stop sign in the middle of an empty parking lot at midnight in a snowstorm with no one else in sight, she will still come to a complete stop and look both ways. Cindy will only cross the street when the sign says walk. Doesn't matter if there's not a car for miles. She is not going to disobey the sign. The tag on mattresses and pillows, (laughs) right? That says do not remove under penalty of law. Cindy keeps them on. They're on everything in our house. If our airplane boarding pass says group two, and I dare to move forward when they call group one, Cindy's mad. If for some reason our seats on a plane aren't together, I tell Cindy, don't worry about it, just sit by me, and whoever's there will gladly trade. That makes her incredibly nervous because her name is not assigned to that seat. A matter of fact, if I sit in her seat and tell her to sit in mine, she's uncomfortable. If a sign says don't walk on the grass, Cindy will absolutely not walk on the grass, even if there's not any grass. If you paint a line down the middle of the hallway and you put a sign that says don't touch this line, Cindy will not touch that line. In fact, she will stay as far away from that line as possible. I, on the other hand, am not quite as much a rule follower. Neither are Tyler and Parker. And so we drive Cindy absolutely crazy. We cut tags off pillows. We board airplanes early. We cross against the light. We walk on forbidden lines. We sometimes sit in the wrong seat. Now, admittedly, there are times we do it just to make her nervous. A few months ago, a group of us were walking to dinner after a meeting in New York City. I was leading. I knew where we were going, and at a cross street, no cars coming for miles and hours. I crossed the street. Everyone followed. After a few seconds, I realized Cindy wasn't beside me, and I turned around to look for her. I promise, true story, she was standing at the empty intersection waiting for the light to change. <laughs> she, even though we had all gone, she was not going to cross that empty road when there were zero cars coming from any direction because the sign said, wait. That makes me crazy. (laughs) After however many years we've been married, it still makes me crazy. But when I walk through the church, I pick up every single piece of trash I see. I don't understand why people would drop a candy wrapper, a bulletin, or a Kleenex in God's house and not pick it up. For that matter, I don't understand how they walk past it, look at a piece of trash, and leave it there and don't pick it up. From an early age, the rule, don't make a mess in God's house, was drilled into me. I'd like to drill that into you. (laughs) I would never even think of violating that rule. I was taught to tithe, to give God 10% of my income at five years old. That was God's rule. We don't break God's rule. I never have. I've tithed on everything and then some for more than 40 years. On no level do I understand people who ignore God's rule about finances. Isn't that interesting? I will cross against the light, walk on the grass, and recklessly cut off mattress tags without fear. But I fear littering in God's house, and I would never dream of keeping God's 10% for myself. And over time, I've learned most people are that way. Some rules they follow, others they ignore. But that can be a dangerous way to live. How do you decide which rules to follow, and what if you ignore the wrong rule? Most of the trouble in your life comes from breaking rules. Your parents' rules, the rules at school, the law, God's rules. When it comes to God's rules and laws, 
Many people have a basic misunderstanding. They see God's laws as restrictions designed to keep them from fun. They fail to realize that God's laws are actually designed for their protection and safety. You put a, ba a baby in a playpen to play. Basically a padded prison <laughs> because your baby is safe inside its walls. When it's time for bed, you put that same baby in a crib with sides, again, just like a jail. The sides of the crib aren't restrictions designed to ruin that baby's life. They're there to protect her from falling. When you go to the zoo, the animals are behind bars. The bars keep the animals from hurting you and you from hurting the animals. A zoo without bars is called a jungle. And a jungle is where you get eaten, which on my list of ways I don't want to die, that's way, way up there. <laughs> Guardrails don't exist to keep you from having fun flying in your car. They're designed to save your life. Can you imagine a hockey game with no glass or walls? <laughs> Everyone in the crowd would be missing two front teeth. The barriers are for your protection. In the same way, God's laws are designed to protect you from sin, from Satan, from danger, and from harm. It's important that you know and follow his laws, his rules, his instructions, so you can live safe, free, healthy, and blessed. In this series, we're going to study God's most famous laws, the Ten Commandments. The series took a lot of research in case you, you're into reading and you'd like to read what I studied. I put a list of the sources I used at the end of the outline. So you can look at that and check them out and read them. Now, before we look at the first commandment, I want to just set the stage for you. For 400 years, the Israelites had been prisoners in Egypt under the rule of cruel dictators. Exodus 1 says, the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied greatly and became exceedingly numerous, so the land was filled with them. Then a new king, who didn't know about Joseph, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become much too numerous. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. If war breaks out, they'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over to, impress, to oppress them with forced labor. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with hard labor and brick and mortar, with all kinds of work in the fields. And in all their hard labor, the Egyptians used them ruthlessly. It's a miserable life. The Israelites were slaves. They were subject to the rules and laws of the Egyptians and the wishes of their masters. Finally, after 400 years, through a series of plagues and then miracles, God delivered his people from slavery, set them free. I encourage you to read Exodus chapter 1 through 17. It's a, it's a reminder of the powerful God that you serve. Now we pick up the story with the Israelites out of Egypt and about 60 days, a couple months, into their journey in the Promised Land. In the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on the very day they came to the desert of Sinai, Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, good place to go. The Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what I want you to tell the people. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you're to speak to the Israelites. The Lord through Moses, reminded the people of his love for him, of the victories they'd won, the future he had planned, and then what happened next was unforgettable. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain, 
and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled, which you understand. You would too. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently. The sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. It was an incredible demonstration of God's power. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. And Moses obeyed. Good choice. He went. And on Mount Sinai, God spoke to Moses and gave him instructions for the people. And we call those instructions the Ten Commandments. Those ten laws provided the early framework for God's relationship with his people. The Israelites had lived for centuries under the laws of the Egyptians. Now, God let them know it was a new day. This was how they were to live. This was how they were to relate to God and how they were to relate to each other. The Ten Commandments have endured and have a significant impact on our world. They're the foundation for both Jewish and Christian morals and ethics. The early church in the New Testament accepted the Ten Commandments as the foundation of God's laws. Still today, the Ten Commandments are recognized as God's law. In fact, the highest legal office in our country, the Supreme Court, has the Ten Commandments as the focus of art throughout the building. They're the center of the sculpture over the East Portico. They're inside the courtroom on the south wall. They're on the oak door at the entrance to the courtroom. God spoke those laws, and God spoke then these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Pretty good introduction. God rescued the Israelites from slavery to the Egyptians. He's rescued us from slavery to sin. Because of what God has done for us, then this is how we're to live for him. Grace comes first, being led out of Egypt, being led out of sin. Holiness comes next, keeping God's law. The order is important. You are not saved because you obey the Ten Commandments. You obey the Ten Commandments because you're saved. So, well, the Ten Commandments are short, simple statements. They also represent key values and ideas, ideals that God wanted and wants in his people. God's people were supposed to be holy and pure and different from the world around them. God's rules show us what he values. So, let's learn the first one. Verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. And the temptation is to read that verse and decide, fantastic, I'm one for one. I got it down. I don't have any idols. I don't have evil spirits. I don't pray to other gods. I love Jesus. Winner. If that's your response, then you miss the whole intent of the first commandment. Instead, read God's instruction this way. I want to be number one in your life. You're not put to put anyone or anything before me. I want to be first in everything. A good way to restate the first commandment is put God first. An encounter between a rich young ruler and Jesus will help you better understand the concept. The ruler was rich. He'd accumulated a lot of stuff. He was smart. He knew all the laws and all the principles, highly educated. Then one day he met Jesus. And this guy really wanted to follow Jesus. But he had one part of his life that he wasn't ready or willing to give up. His encounter with Jesus is a sad one. The story is found in Matthew 19. Now a man, and we know from other accounts he was a rich young ruler, came to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what's good? Jesus replied, there's only one who's good. If you want to enter a life, obey the commandments. Which ones? The man inquired. So this guy is just like your kids. 
Jesus said, obey the commandments. He wanted to know more. He said, he didn't really want to obey them all. He wanted to know which one really mattered. Like, what was the top? Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, love your neighbors yourself. Ten commandments are divided into two categories. The first four commandments relate to God. The last six relate to man. Jesus knew this guy was basically selfish, so he highlighted the commands that dealt with others. And the guy said, man, I'm good. I got it down. I punched my ticket. All those I've kept. What do I still lack? And then Jesus gave a stunning assignment that flows from the first commandment. Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions, give to the poor. And then you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. We read that and we want to say, wait a minute, Lord. What are you asking? Sell everything? That's not reasonable. It's important to realize Jesus didn't say that to everyone he encountered. Jesus may lay down a different requirement for you or for me. He might tell you to give $1,000 to a missionary. He might tell me to give $10 or $10,000. He might tell me to give my life in full-time ministry. He might tell you to work in the nursery or to join the parking lot team or to drive a bus to pick up the homeless or to pick up the trash in the church. <laughs> that wasn't in my notes. I just inserted that. In this case, Jesus told the rich young ruler to sell everything he had and give it to the poor. Why did Jesus do that? Jesus knew the one thing that would keep this guy from God, giving up his stuff because he had a lot of it. Jesus said, if you want eternal life, give away freely. The young ruler had to decide between earthly treasure and heavenly treasure. He couldn't choose both. God wants to be first. Following and obeying the first commandment means that nothing comes before him. Have you ever been curious how people can go out on a Friday night and get drunk and then come to church on the weekend and not see any contradiction between the two? Or how a man can sit Weekend after weekend next to his wife in church while well, Monday to Friday he's carrying on an affair with someone at work. Do you know why that happens a lot in our culture? Because we have come to the mistaken belief that we can give God some parts of our life, but we have the right to hold on to other areas and to keep them from God's control and God's command. You say to God, I, I want you to have all my life Every area, except God, this one, my relationships. I've got some relationships, and God, I know if I were to say to you, God, lead me in relationships, you'd probably want me to make some changes. You'd want me to end this dating relationship, or you'd want me to change a group of friends. I'm not ready to pay that price, so God, you can have the rest, but I'm going to handle this part of my life on my own. You can't t touch this one. Uh, maybe the thing you're keeping from God is different. Maybe, maybe you say, well, God, I trust you with my relationships. Uh, I'll, I'll give you that, but I don't have 10 minutes for you this week. I'm busy. I have places to go. I have people to meet. I have things to do. My kid's on a traveling team. He's going to get a scholarship. I have my priorities. This area, my time, you can't have. You can have the rest, but not this one. This area right here, it's off the table. Or maybe your issue is you, you've got something in the past and you're having trouble trusting God with that. God, if you saw how ugly my past was, there is so much accumulated crud. I know you don't want to deal with all the broken pieces of my life and all the sin that's accumulated. God, I'll trust you with my future, but I'll hang on to the shame and the guilt of my past because I, I'm not sure 
that I can just trust you with that. Or maybe your deal is, God, I can, I can trust you with my past, but I've got some plans for my future. I know where I want to end up. Someday I'll connect with you in heaven. I'm looking forward to that. But meantime, I'm going to live according to my agenda because, God, I got some goals. I've worked for these. God, you can take care of my past, and I'll see you in heaven. But all these in-between years, they're going to be mine. I'm sorry, God, but that is just completely off the table. Or maybe your issue is the same as the rich young ruler. God, you can't have my money. I'm a spender, and I know what I want. And if I give you 10%, I can't buy those shoes. Or God, I'm a saver, and I'm insecure about retirement, my investment funds, and my portfolios. You can have my past. You can have my future. You can have my relationships and my time. As long as it doesn't touch my personal economy, because my money is my money if this table represents God's blessing and favor and protection, then I want to put everything in my life on the table. All these things you can bless and protect, but my marriage, God, I'll handle that one on my own. It would be crazy to take your marriage off the table. The first command is, you shall have no other gods before me. God says, me first. I don't want there to be anything that takes priority over me. Nothing should be off base to me. No other gods, nothing. No one's to come before me. Oh, all of a sudden that first commandment's a little more difficult, isn't it? You went from being one for one to O oh for one. Do you know what's interesting? Most of the problems happen in the areas that you decide to keep for yourself, to keep from God. What you keep for yourself and don't give to God will always be the crisis area in your life. God will allow those areas to, def to fail so he can have all of you, your trust, your devotion, your time, your attention, so he can truly be first in every area of your life. God wants all of your life. He wants to be the only one you serve. He wants you to trust him with everything, not just a part. God said, you shall have no other gods before me. In this story, Jesus raised the bar. He wanted someone who would follow him completely. Jesus really wasn't all that interested in the guy's money. What he wanted was his love and his undivided attention. It came down to a battle of wills. The guy was saying, what do I want? Instead of what does God want? There was a spiritual tug of war. The rich young ruler couldn't make the decision to sell everything and give the money away. He was willing to do, he was willing to trust God with everything else. But his money was off the table. Stuff mattered more than following Jesus. When he found out following Jesus required giving up everything, he walked away because the cost was too high. He wanted to give Jesus part of his life, but not all of it. He decided there was just one other God before God, his money. And here's the principle. Like the rich young ruler, whatever you consider off the table will ultimately destroy you. The only choice is to commit it all, to commit everything to God. Verse 22 is the end of the story. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Head down, he walked away because he wasn't willing to pay the price. Think about what might have been. He might have become Jesus' best friend. He could have been an eyewitness to the resurrection. He could have seen miracles. He might have been a leader of the early church. There might even be a book of the Bible written by him. But he was never heard from again. We have no idea what happened to that rich young ruler. In fact, we don't even know his name. 
you shall have no other gods before me. Do you know what that means? Nothing comes before Jesus. Your relationship, your schedule, your time, your future, your marriage, your plans, your money, your family. Nothing before God. Can you really say, I have no other gods before you, but refuse to tithe and give God 10% of your money? Can you really say, no other gods before you, but drop out of church for three months because you have a boat? Or your kid has soccer tournaments? Can you really say, I have no other God before you, but stay in a relationship that you know God doesn't approve of? Can you really say, I have no other God before you, but not trust God with your future? Can you really say, I have no other gods before you? Will you feed an addiction that you refuse to let go of? Can you really say, I have no other gods before you? And all of a sudden you realize, forget the Ten Commandments, I got to start following and obeying commandment number one. God wants it all. He wants to be first place and the central priority in every area of your life. God wants you to say, Lord, there is nothing off the table with you. That's why he said, you shall have no other gods before me. You might be watching or listening and thinking, I want to give my life in missions. You'll never get to that place until you're first willing to put every area of your life under God's control. If you're not willing to tithe to give your money, you'll never give your life. If you can't got, trust God with your relationships, you'll never be able to trust Him in a foreign country. If you won't give your habits to God, then you'll never give your future to Him. See, I don't know God's specific plan for your life, but I know this. He wants every area, every part. He made that clear when He said, You shall have no other gods before me. So here's my question. Is God first in your life? In every area, or are there areas that are off limits to God? Are there areas that you've put before Him? God, we ask your forgiveness. We ask you to forgive us for taking things off the table and for foolishly thinking that we can handle that part of our lives without following your commands, without your blessing, without your favor, without your protection. Lord, forgive us for thinking that we can ignore your commands about money and still survive financially. Lord, forgive us for thinking that our past is too much for you to handle. Forgive us, Lord, for allowing other things to creep in and for, for our time to be our time instead of your time. Lord, forgive us for those things we've taken off the table and kept for ourselves. And so we commit everything every part to you. Understanding, Lord, what that means. But in response to your commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. We commit that right now, Lord, in Jesus' name.